Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Building a Continuum of Care for People with Serious Illness, State Strategies to Support Patient Engagement. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kitty Purington, and I am a Senior Program Director with the National Academy for State Health Policy. Before we get started, I wanted to thank the John A. Harkford Foundation for their very generous support of Nashby's Palliative Care Resource Hub. Also, I want to thank Ronnie Snyder, Amy Berman, and Scott Bain, our very supportive project officers. Uh, next slide, please. Just a few logistics before I turn things over to our speakers. Uh, please note that your lines will be muted during the webinar. We welcome your questions and comments. And if you'd like to ask a question, please just click the Q&A button to submit that. And we will try to take as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations. We will also be recording the session and posting the recording and slide deck on the Nashby website after today's event. Next slide, please. We have a really fantastic lineup of speakers with us today. And to save some time, their full bios will be, also, will be um, posted also along with the webinar materials to our website. We will have some opening remarks from Amy Berman, who is a senior program officer with the John A. Hartford Foundation. And then following that, we'll hear from Dr. Caroline Blom, senior research scientist at the National Committee for Quality Assurance, or NCQA. She, she is joined by her colleague, Christine Topi, Topi rather, um, assistant vice president of state affairs at NCQA. We'll uh, round out the presentation with Dr. Emily Transu, who is a Medicaid director at, Washington, at the Washington State Healthcare Authority. And we also have um, Laura Pennington, who is, a, who is the Quality Measurement and Improvement Manager with Washington State Healthcare Authority, who is available to answer questions. Uh, next slide, please. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Amy Berman. Take it away, Amy. Hello, and thank you, Kitty. I'm Amy Berman, Senior Program Officer at the John A. Hartford Foundation, a proud funder of both Nashby and NCQA, and a sponsor of today's webinar on building a continuum of care for people living with serious illness. On behalf of the entire team at the John A. Hartford Foundation, I wanna thank all of our presenters and everyone in the audience for joining today. Your interest in ensuring that the care of the seriously ill focuses on what matters most is music to our ears. That's because, next slide please, the John A. Hartford Foundation is a national philanthropy based in New York City with a mission to improve the care of older adults. And we work in three main areas, creating age-friendly health systems, supporting family caregivers, and improving serious illness and end-of-life care. Next slide, please. Today's session is part of a larger grant from the John A. Hartford Foundation that supports Nashby in convening and engaging state leaders to improve care of people with serious illness, improving access to and the quality of palliative care services. Next slide, please. We hope you will spread the word and take advantage of other resources and tools that Nashby is producing with our support to help all states better ensure care of older adults and individuals living with serious illness. Next slide, please. We also proudly support NCQA through a grant initiative that is promoting the use of health quality measures that evaluate how well clinicians and health plans address what matters to older adults and their families, an essential component of the age-friendly health system's 4Ms framework. The best care for older adults is guided by the unique health goals and priorities of the person. Last, I would also like to thank Amy Tewerson, Kitty Purington, Wendy Fox Grage, and Salam Tashali for their leadership on our Serious Illness Care grant at Nashby, and also offer special thanks to Caroline Blaum and team who lead our grant at NCQA. Finally, I want to note that our foundation has many resources that we hope you will utilize to ensure that all care is age friendly, supports family caregivers, and improves serious and end of life care. care. To get to know us better, please visit johnahartford.org and sign up for our e news. We look forward to learning with you all today, and we thank you. Enjoy the webinar, and I'll turn it back to you, Kitty. 
Thanks so much, Amy. And um, I'm going to turn it over to the NCQA team to talk about their work on person-driven outcome measures. Hey, thank you, Kitty. And hello, everyone. I'm Caroline Blom from uh, NCQA. I'm a senior research scientist and also by background, a geriatrician and palliative care physician. And I'm very thrilled to be able to come here and talk to you about uh, our uh, person-driven outcome measures. Again, uh, this work has been generously supported by the Johnny Hartford Foundation and the SCAN Foundation. Next slide, please. So the, the person-driven outcome measures are designed for complex patients. And as a geriatrician, I always think of complex patients as older adults with multiple chronic conditions or with frailty or with serious illness. But this is just to remind everybody that their complex patients come in all sizes and shapes. And uh, they're, most are older adults, but not all. Mental illness, people with multiple diseases, people who have uh, serious disabilities, people who are frail, people who have equity and social challenges, all fall in the realm of complex patients, that person-driven outcome measures are really designed to uh, measure what matters. Next slide. Next slide, please. And this sort of uh, gets to the definitions of what I'm going to be talking about. NCQA has developed person-driven outcome measures that are designed to measure care that matters for complex patients. For such patients, care should align most with what matters to people, their health outcome goals. And measurement, we think, can be used to drive this kind of care that matters and encourage clinicians to deliver care that's aligned with health outcome goals. For quality measures, however, health outcome goals must be measured and tracked in a standardized way. And that's what NCQA has spent some time learning to do. Next slide, please. And this slide sort of illustrates a model of how we integrate measurement with clinical care to really drive a care that matters to the person. You can see the clinical care in blue and uh, the, uh, the measurement sort of in green. And person-driven outcome measures integrate care and measurement. And that's sort of what I call the measure of the future. It's not a measure that comes you know, two years later or some other time. It's integrated with care at the point of delivery. So the, the idea is that uh, the clinician and the patient together decide and listen what's important to the person. Then that, that, that goal, the personal goal has to be tracked in a way that we can measure it and, and track it and figure out what's going on. So that's what NCQA worked on, a way to translate the personal goal of the person into a uh, a standardized methodology that can be tracked. And there are two ways that we did this through person reported outcome measures or through something called goal attainment scaling, which I'll get to in a minute. But then back to the clinical work, then there's a care plan or clinical decision making or an action step directed towards helping that person achieve their goal. Then the per that's reassessed to make sure the goal is correct and, and progress is being made. And finally, there would be a measure that documents progress on the goal or goal achievement. Next slide. And here's an example of what matters most to people. And there are many things person, that people would have personal goals. But often people say they want to stay out of the hospital. They want to attend maybe their doctor appointment or counseling sessions. They often want to go to church on Sunday. Or they might want to be very engaged in the community, teach arts and crafts, go to classes, or sometimes be able to walk around the block with their dog. Very common types of goals. Next slide. And this slide shows sort of beginning to get into the opera, opera, uh, implementation of this. Uh, in other words, how to translate the personal goal of a person to a way that we can measure it. One way is through promise measures. So many of these have been developed over the years by the NIH and other people, other researchers. And uh, participants uh, engage and choose from a bank of promise measures. Uh, when NCQA tested this, and I'll talk about that in a minute, we participants were able to choose from 24 promise instruments. And this examples are in the slide here. For example, a participant personal goal, a person's goal, maybe they wanted to relieve their back pain so they can woodwork. So they would select a promise that talked about pain interfering with daily activities. Or for the last one, maybe the person really wants to plant a garden. They want to be well enough to plant a garden this spring. So a promise of physical function that measures physical function might be what we would track. Next slide. 
Another way to do this, which many people like better, is something called goal attainment scaling. And this methodology preserves the original sort of verbiage or that original idea behind the personal goal of the person. And here, this is an example of an 82-year-old person with multiple chronic condition, mobility, depression, arthritis, and heart failure. And her goal is to walk her dog outside once a week. And right now, she's just, she's homebound. She's just sitting at home. And she sets her goal. And this, and what we do is the goal is um, put on a scale. What she's doing now, she doesn't go outside, is negative one. And she's expecting to be able to walk her dog outside once a week. Uh, and she can do better than expected, pos positive one or positive two, or she could do worse than expected, negative two. Uh, this actually turns out to be a very flexible tool for tracking personal goals. As you can imagine, it takes some clinician training. But as I say, I'm a clinician and clinicians have to get trained on many things. This is not the hardest thing any clinician ever learned. But regardless, it does take a bit of training, but becomes a very flexible way to track personalized goals. Next slide. So out of these tracking and the idea of setting a goal, tracking it, following up and and uh, assessing whether uh, progress is being made or achievement, the NCQA has developed three measures. And these are proposed person-driven outcome measures. And they're sort of simple in concept. The first one is assessment of a person-driven outcome. The second one is follow-up of the person-driven outcome, if you just remember back to the arrow figure. And the third one is the achievement of a person-driven outcome. And achievement of the person-driven outcome is pretty uh, flexible. It can be, a person can be making progress, they can achieve it, they can do better. Uh, and in some cases, perhaps with frail elder, their goal is to maintain where they are and they can, it can uh, handle that too. Uh, next slide. Now I'm gonna to talk about a series of slides uh, testing uh, these three person-driven outcome measures based on goal elicitation and tracking. And uh, generously supported by the John A. Hartford Foundation and the SCAN Foundation and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, since 2015, uh, these measures have been subjected to pretty rigorous testing. Um, and there was a pilot test, there was a functional disability project, and there was a serious illness project, all of which were related and tested the person-driven outcome measures. And this slide just summarizes all the types of clinicians and cl clinical sites and patients that were part of the testing. All in all, the summary is about um, a thousand patients, over a hundred clinicians of all different types, and 13 different or 13 different care uh, delivery sites. And the care delivery sites were sort of all over the country, in California, in the Midwest, in the South, in New York. Uh, and uh, some of them were Medicaid case management, some of them were chronic disease case management, others, there was also geriatric and serious illness programs. The clinicians varied also from care managers, social workers, RNs, advanced practice nurses, uh, PCPs, geriatricians, and palliative care physicians. So lots of different types of people. And here you can see that there was case management in DSNPs or Medicaid health plan. In fact, there was a behavioral health plan that we, was tested in and uh, case management in integrated delivery systems, accountable care organizations, and also geriatric practices. Lots of testing. Uh, next slide. And we got some results. And the results were um, very much what we hoped we'd get. We showed variability among sites in measure performance. And this just shows the measures two and three, follow up and achievement on this slide. And uh, basically this behaves like a measure. Some sites were able to do this very well and some sites were less able, so there was a gap in care. So if you look at the functional disability sites, for example, the average follow-up was 62% with a range in the sites from 24% to 83. The average achievement was 66% with a range in the sites from 40 to 82%. So it was a measure. Uh, for the functional disability sites, that was set up a bit more like a research project and we have claims and we have another um, interviews. And uh, we're able to see using claims data that the number of persons in the interventions uh, compared to a control group had uh, decreased hospitalizations in the six months uh, after compared to the six months before. So that is an interesting signal uh, that perhaps there's, um, this may influence some utilization. There was also a lot of qualitative work done uh, by uh, NCQA 
uh, trying to track the experience of patients, caregivers, clinicians, even administrators. And as you can expect, the patients and caregivers really did like this measure. They appreciated the experience. Some people really uh, thought it was the first time they were asked what mattered to them. Uh, they felt that the approach offered some accountability and helped them with their uh, self-management between care visits. The clinicians felt that they uh, better understood patients' preferences, although of course they were concerned about time and workflow. Um, they felt, a lot of the physicians felt this was better than checkbox measures. It really uh, encouraged conversation with the patients, which they really liked. Um, and even administrative people thought this was a good idea, although they did ex uh, recommend integration with existing workflow. Next slide. So the testing and all the work that NCQA had done over the years is pretty much set up these measures for the next phase. And we're about, again, to, we're, we're sort of uh, working on our next phase now, started last April, again, with uh, generous support from the John A. Hartford Foundation and the SCAN Foundation. There are three big things we're doing for the next phase, which we're in the middle of, it, partly why we're talking to you today. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is prioritize and implement pathways to widespread use of the person-driven outcome measures. And basically what that means is that we wanna get this measure used from the point of view of NCQA, we wanna get it used in our programs and products such as in our patient-centered medical home or in our long-term services and support measures, um, or perhaps in uh, some of our work with, decent, with uh, special needs plans. But on and the other hand, we also want to get it endorsed by NQF so it can have widespread dissemination throughout the country. Uh, second big thing we want to do is create demand for the person-driven outcome measures through communication strategy. And we're working with a, a strategic communications firm to develop a message and truly really try to get the word out, both to patients and to policymakers and decision makers in healthcare about uh, using measures that matter. And finally, we want to address the issues that the clinicians do bring up. The clinicians, as I said, like it, but it has to really integrate into workflow. Clinicians have to be trained. And uh, so that's uh, a big, another big goal is technical assistance uh, with workflow and training. So next slide. So we've been talking to states and I'm gonna give it to my colleague, uh, my colleague uh, Christine Topi, because to talk about how different states are thinking about implementing it and using PDO measures. Thanks, Thanks Caroline. Um, we're really excited about this work. Um, obviously, as a measure developer, we are you know steeped in the experience of clinical measures and patient experience measures, and I think this really kind of takes it to the next level. Um, and so, um, in our work in engaging states on you know how to kind of uh, build a better mousetrap or have better tools to achieve the goals of states and public health and health in general and health equity. You know, we're talking about this, um, this measure and kind of what we've learned about how it can be applied. Uh, and what's been really fascinating for us is um, how well received the concept has been, um, how much interest across the various stakeholders we've engaged there's been, and, and how it might actually be applied. And so we've, we're sharing uh, with you here some examples of that, some of the states that we've engaged. So these, these uh, examples include uh, states as well as the stakeholders within those states uh, who we've had conversations with about, about the measure, doing a briefing like this on what it is, how it's been tested and how it might be implemented. Um, and so uh, to give you a flavor for that, um, one of the one of the examples is, you know, Arizona has targeted investments programs, which are uh, within the Medicaid program, um, and it provides financial incent incentives to eligible Medicaid providers um, to develop uh, systems for integrated care. And so a measure like this would really support the kind of end goals of a program like that. Um, California has a lot going on in the Medicaid space right now with CalAIM and, um, and it's kind of um, a evolution of managed care, but there are also, you know, lots of other areas of, of um, kind of um, innovation happening. And so, you know, we're, we're exploring how the measure might be applied in a PACE model. Um, in New York, uh, there's um, a lot of interest around uh, kind of founded in the uh, age-friendly health systems and the potential application of a measure for AAAs and the provider systems that they work with. Uh, in Tennessee uh, and in Texas, there's a real interest on the behavioral health front. Um, so how might the managed care organizations and their behavioral health uh, 
um, uh, provider partners um, embed this measure for better outcomes um, in those receiving behavioral health ser healthcare services. Um, and in Texas, um, there's um, a group of um, uh, certified community behavioral health centers uh, that, that we've been kind of talking with leadership about um, how this measure might be um, a good um, kind of an enhanced version of, uh, of measures that they're kind of getting at in different ways and that might actually be a, a better version and a more streamlined way of getting at um, um, accountability because that's the other facet to these conversations is we don't wanna add additional measures that are non-value added from the perspective of the patient, the provider and the payer. We want things that are going to kind of su support the collective goals and be able to, um, to, pro to provide a better result and that means you know, a better result for the patient, a better uh, experience for the provider and being able to help support the patient in their care goals, and a better level of accountability for those that regulate and pay for healthcare. So I think that you know, going into these conversations, that is a major priority for us in being able to propose how, these, how this, um, this concept and, and uh, tool could be applied in a variety of different settings, um, depending on kind of what the need is in any given state. So with that, I'll hand it back to Caroline. Next slide, please. Thank you, Christine. Okay, so this is just a wrap up and to summarize. So to promote person-centered care, we need person-centered measures. So what I've talked about is a novel approach to measuring what matters most to individuals. We think these person-driven outcome measures can push practice delivery change towards care that matters and can be used for care planning, for quality measurement and at perhaps someday for accountability. And uh, we are working towards implementing these measures in a digital environment. That's a whole nother talk that I didn't talk about today, but uh, you know, the future is coming. So to learn more, we have more on our website, measuring what matters most to older adults at NCQA. So I, I'm finished and I guess I'm turning it over to Emily from state of Washington. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. This is one of those terrible moments where there's so much I would like to um, additionally say based on what I just heard. <laughs> it's hard to stay focused. Such an exciting topic. And thank you for that. I feel as though many of the um, sentences you said there, I'd like to, to pull into this conversation. So hi, I'm Emily Transu. I am a medical director at the Washington State Healthcare Authority, which is the cabinet agency that oversees Medicaid and public and school employee benefits. Um, talking today about how we support patient-centered care with uh, shared decision-making and patient decision-making. So on to the next slide, what is shared decision-making? This is the definition from the National Learning Consortium that I think encapsulates a lot of, um, of what we care about in this process. So this is a process in which clinicians and patients work together to make decisions and select tests, treatments, or care plans that are based on clinical evidence that balance risks and expected outcomes with patient preferences and values. And we've highlighted in red a bunch of pieces to this, and each of those is really important to this process. And we'll talk a little more about that. On to the next slide. These are really particularly applicable for preference sensitive conditions. So shared decision making is important either when there's more than one right answer, more than one reasonable thing that a reasonable person could choose, or there's a lot of uncertainty about all of the options. So when I fell off a trapeze and had a compound fracture of my wrist, it just needed to be fixed. There wasn't a, you could do this or you could do that. It's really, here's the right answer. And you're kind of in the space of informed consent. You need to know what you're getting into. But shared decision-making really happens when there are many things that you could do that would be appropriate. And in that setting, helping someone make a choice that's congruent with their values is really, is really critical. So some examples of this, Procedures like joint replacement or spine surgery, there are pros and cons to having them. Um, medications, do you wanna take a statin? Well, what's your risk? What's the likelihood of side effects versus the benefit that you would get? And how do those, how do those play out in terms of what matter to you? 
prostate cancer screening, certainly a classic um, one in this regard and treatment. Um, how do you feel about having a, a treatment therapy regimen that you might or might not need and that could have side effects? Um, you know, how do you balance these things against each other relative to your own values? And certainly end of life and palliative care um, are, are absolutely kind of fully in this space in terms of really eliciting somebody's decisions, uh, somebody's values, and then making sure they make decisions congruent with those. On to the next slide. Why is this important? Well, there's a deep literature on this really showing that systematic use of shared decision making has all kinds of benefits. It can improve people's experience, maybe not surprising. Uh, it can improve actual health outcomes, which is kind of interesting. It can reduce variation and reduce health disparities and increase equity. And this is one of the things we think is especially important. So if you look at things like joint replacement, where there are real differences in populations in terms of how often they get these procedures, um, African-Americans get them at a much lower rate than Caucasians in this country. Um, Using a systematic shared decision making approach tends to even those out. So it reduces overutilization in people who are overutilizing and also improves underutilization. It tends to improve appropriateness of utilization and spending, and those are carefully chosen words. This is not something that we see as a cost reduction strategy, but really as an increasing value by making sure that people are getting what's appropriate for them. And it does support value-based care and population health strategies, again, by ensuring that care is appropriate. It supports patient-centered care. We'll talk more about details on that on the next slide. And I'll also call out that in general, studies around shared decision-making involve use of a high-quality patient decision aid, and that's something we'll talk a little more about, too. On to the next slide. In terms of patient-centered care, these are the eight principles of patient-centered care as described by Picker. And I won't go through this in detail, but the red ones here are really things that are specifically supported by shared decision-making. So almost half of these principles are, are very much in play around shared decision-making. We're respecting patients' preferences, the information and education that's necessary for patient-centered care, providing emotional support for someone's needs as they make decisions, and the involvement of family and friends in decisions as well. So there's a lot of overlap between these principles. On to the next slide. What are patient decision aids? So these are tools that support patients and providers in having these conversations around shared decision making by really providing information that a patient needs in order to make an informed choice and also help it, helping to create structure around the elements that need to happen for shared decision making. These can come in a wide variety of forms. Um, they can be written materials. It can be as simple as kind of a little one page um, bullet point. Here's some pieces. They can be videos that can go through interviews with patients who have made different choices, those who are happy about their choices, those who are less happy. So there can be this kind of introduction to, to people who have made these experience, had these experiences. There are interactive websites that, um, that have patient decision aids that kind of let you input things and then vary what you're going to see based on those choices. Most patient decision aids include graphics that help people to really understand the choice on a deeper level, including presenting statistical information in ways that are easy for people to understand and absorb. We know that health literacy plays a, a huge role in the way people make decisions and really helping to overcome some of the barriers of low health literacy through these devices. There's evidence that use of high quality patient decision aids leads to a number of things, it leads to increased knowledge of people's options, perhaps unsurprisingly, better perception of risk, which can be very, very um, broadly misinterpreted by patients in a lot of decisions, lower conflict about decisions. So people tend to be happier and more solid in the decision that they make if they use these tools. And they make choices that are more consistent with values. So you see sort of less of this, I believe in ABC, but I chose a choice that really doesn't make sense in that setting. 
Also a greater participation in decision-making back to engagement. These really support um, better engagement. Incidentally, we also see fewer people on average choosing major surgery in, this, um, in the setting of, uh, of good shared decision-making, which may reflect that kind of better understanding of, of risks and options. Um, and the fact that we sometimes present bias information as the uh, as medical system. We've got some references here on some of these um, pieces where they came from. On to the next slide. So that's kind of what a, what a patient decision aid is. How did we get to this work in Washington? So for us, this journey has been longstanding and it really started in the early 2000s. Um, feel free to signal to me, by the way, if I'm not doing well on the audio. Um, so Jack Lindberg from Dartmouth came out in the early 2000s and presented to legislators and other leaders in Washington on clinical variation across regions of the state. I imagine many people are familiar with the Dartmouth Atlas that looks at how many procedures and what kind of care is given and just how much that can vary place to place. Our leadership responded with a number of pieces of legislation, and shared decision-making was a key element of that. And the aim there was to reduce that inappropriate variation without restricting choice. Nobody wanted to say, you can't do this, you have to do that, but really to get to appropriate utilization based on people's preferences. And as I said before, there's evidence that shared decision-making decreases over-utilization, but also increases under-utilization. And that was a, a key element for us and has been throughout this work. There were several pieces of legislation that were passed to support this work. One was the establishment of the Robert Bree Collaborative in Washington, which looks at areas of unwarranted variation and produces evidence-based guidelines and improvement strategies. And this is a multi-stakeholder uh, group that operates. Um, it's it's supported by HCA, but it's really an independent group that looks at these areas and produces recommendations. There was also legislation that established the authority of the healthcare authority to certify patient decision aids and created some legal protections for providers who use them. So essentially in Washington, if a provider use, does a shared decision-making process with a certified aid, the onus of proof shifts in a lawsuit around informed consent um, to assume that informed consent was done and there needs to be proof that it wasn't as opposed to the other way around. In 2019, the Bree Collaborative selected shared decision-making implementation as one of their topics. So they ran a work group that really developed a number of recommendations on how to implement and expand this. And I'll say, I, I graduated from Dartmouth Medical School um, in the late 1990s and, and sort of thought this was the way the world was. And I think it's still a little bit of a niche. And one of our challenges has been to figure out how do we move this from being this sort of niche thing that everyone thinks is a good idea into something that everybody is doing and really expecting as part of their work. On to the next slide. So more specifics on our role as a healthcare authority. We have this ability to certify patient decision aids, and we'll talk more about that. We also promote use of this work in our role as a purchaser. So we purchase healthcare for 2.1 million lives on the Medicaid side, and essentially 700,000 public and school employee benefits. We incorporate requirements around this work into contracts, and we're continuing to develop that. We also provide training and support to providers. I love Dr. Blum's uh, line earlier that this is not the hardest thing a physician ever learned, but it does take some training. This tends to be work that we all think we're doing. You know, I'm a good doc, I'm thoughtful, I'm a good communicator, of course I do this. But when you really sit down with people and say, these are all the elements, are you doing that? Um, in general, the answer is no, unless people have really specific training. So that's something we help to support. And we've also collaborated on developing and disseminating the free recommendations for this work. We've done a number of things to convene statewide discussion around spread and sustainability, and, and those are ongoing efforts. On to the next slide. Why does this certification piece matter? And, and really, as patient decisions become more widely used, it's really important that they, that they be good. 
And that, that incorporates a number of things. They have to be accurate. The information has to be appropriate. And they have to really do their job in supporting patients and exploring values. Minimizing bias is a key piece of this. We've reviewed a lot of these over the years, and many of them are wonderful. And some of them um, you really wouldn't want people, people using in terms of the degree of slant toward one option or another. And of course, for us in Washington, those enhanced liability protections are partly uh, activated by certification as well. On the next slide, how do we how do we do this? So we have a review panel that does um, a review of each aid based on standards that are established by the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration. Long um, long title there, it does. We also have a review of the evidence that's included in the AIDS, and we uh, contract with the Evidence-Based Practice Center at OHSU to do that and make sure that the underlying evidence is appropriate. And then our chief medical officer makes the final decision on certification, considering input um, from the panel as well as subject matter experts. On to the next slide. I won't spend too much time on these criteria. We can make them available. But they look at things like, is it clear what the condition is that's being discussed and the decision that's being, being supported? And this is really around that, okay, here are your values, here's the information, but there's a decision in play. Who is it for? What are the options and all of the options? Um, what are the positive and negative features of each? Values exploration, this is always the hardest one, so we'll spend a little more time on that on the next slide. Um, enabling comparison amongst the options, and that is often done with tables or with, um, with graphs. We look for whether there's balance in the presentation and lack of bias. If probabilities are presented, there's some requirements around how that's done. And then there are some more specialized um, criteria, just looking at making sure that the developers talk to them, speak to their credentials and conflicts of interest and some very specific questions for screening tests. On to the next slide. Values, I think, is a key piece of this really and the function that they play and also maybe for our discussion today. So the standard here is that an aid has to help patients clarify their values for the outcomes of the options. And they can do that in one of two ways. Either ask patients to think about or rate which of the positive and negative features really matter to them. So I would think, as Dr. Blaum was talking about earlier, you have people who really care about being able to walk the dog, and you have people who really care about staying out of the hospital. So something like a choice for a major surgery that could enable you to be more active, but also would involve a long-term hospital stay, you know, letting people really think about how they balance out those pros and cons. Or they can do what's called an indirect value clarification, which is really helping them envision what their life would be like if they made each of these choices, what those impacts are physically, socially, or psychologically. So a couple ways to do this, but it's really important that this piece be done. On to the next slide. We have certified a total of 44 patient decision aids on a number of topics. I won't um, spend too much time on these, but a lot of them do uh, pertain to chronic disease. Um, and specifically we also included um, end of life care. I'll speak to that one a little bit more. This has been an ongoing journey for us. It's hard to do. It, we wish we could do more, um, but it takes a lot of resources to do this work. On to the next slide. Speaking directly to end of life care, we have certified a total of 24 patient decision aids around end of life. This is different from a pulsed form. It's not sort of a check the box, yes, no. It's really that underlying exploration of the values that would lead to those choices. So it might help someone fill out a pulsed, but it's not just that form. It's also not um, just a um, you know advanced directive type thing. Really what it does is it ensures that patients and families understand all of their available options. And an important piece of all of this is to include no treatment or supportive care, which are a little different from each other, but, but really encouraging people to think through all of their choices and to help the patient or the decision maker make a decision that reflects their choices and values. 
on to the next slide, a few more specific components to that. So these might address any number of decisions. Things like, does someone want to pursue life prolonging care versus hospice? Does someone who's in a nursing home want to have a hospital transfer or not? They can look at things specifically like uh, code status. Does someone want CPR? Does somebody want intubation? What are the circumstances in which they might want that or not? Decisions about dialysis. Many of these are specific to underlying conditions or circumstances, as Dr. Blum spoke to earlier with complex patients. Um, there can be a lot in play, and the implications of a decision will be really different depending on some of those underlying conditions. So what do these decisions look like for someone with dementia, either early or advanced? How do you help them think through and their families think through at what point they might have different goals of care? or for cardiac or pulmonary disease, liver disease, renal disease, all of those things will play out a little bit differently in terms of the possible outcomes, the likelihood of those outcomes, and therefore how they play into someone's values. Another place we see this is with severely premature infants or those with severe conditions, so a different part of the spectrum of life, but a place where values concurrent condition, uh, decisions are really important. These may be focused at the patient, they may be focused on the family or caregiver, or both, depending on the circumstances. And again, really, really looking just back to that values piece. Is this a person who cares about length of life versus quality of life? What are the specific things that they care about or are afraid of? Some people are really afraid of pain. Some people are much more interested in mental clarity than they are in pain at end of life. Um, short and suppressed, thinking about how their decisions impact their family. So looking at all of those things and really ensuring that they make choices that are congruent with what they care about. Next slide. Uh, what are the, some of the things we're doing next? We're having another uh, virtual summit. We used to have in-person summits, but in the age of COVID, we have not so much. Uh, we have one of those coming out on, on March 24th, if anyone's interested. And we are really continuing to look at this implementation piece of how do we, how do we spread this work with our partners, including the folks at the pre-collaborative. That is our last slide, so we can um, move on. Oh, these are some resources that we put together for people who are interested in more information on any of these components. And we're happy to talk more about those. So thanks so much. I will hand back to um, the folks at Ashley. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, Emily and Christine and Dr. Blom as well for all that great information. and. Um, we have a few questions coming in, so I'd love to um, have the opportunity to answer a few of those if we can. Um, and this is for Dr. Transu. Um, was wondering if you could describe a little bit more what the legally protect what legally protecting providers who use the PDO um, means and how that plays out in, in Washington. Oh, and you're on mute. Absolutely. Oh. Yep, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so in general, um, a number of lawsuits play sort of focus on the issue of informed consent. Did somebody have the appropriate information that they needed when they chose to undergo an intervention? Um, and the base foundation of that is that a provider has to prove that they provided informed consent. Um, so if there's a lawsuit where somebody alleges that they, they didn't receive the information that they needed, uh, the provider essentially has no other proof that they did to show that they did. If this is done in Washington with a certified aid, that onus of proof shifts to the patient to show that they weren't informed rather than to the patient to show that they did. So it, it essentially kind of flips that burden of proof and says, if you're doing a shared decision-making process with an aid, the assumption would then be that somebody received the information they needed and it, it would be necessary for them to show that they didn't. I will say, I think this is important in, um, it's an important message as we've talked to people about why they do this work. Um, I've never had anybody say, I, I do this because there's a legal protection. I think it's always because it, it's congruent with 
provider values and how we want to take care of people and, and what we want to provide. So I would just add that, that note. Great, thank you. And um, also encourage other folks to please feel free to um, enter questions into the Q&A button. Um, we also had a question um, for Washington um, around whether you would be able to share the PDAs that you've certified. Yes, absolutely. Um, although with a caveat, and I should say we have Laura Pennington on the on the um, line as well. So Laura should should jump in anytime. She's fabulously knowledge about this, but I, I drew the speaking straw. Um, we we have in the slides, and we can send out a link to our website that has information about the aids that we've certified. So we can send that. The caveat is many of these are proprietary. Um, it's a it's a very intensive and expensive process to develop a PDA, to do that literature review, to do the development. So this is for for many groups kind of a, a business model, um, and so we're not able to make the full PDA available if it's proprietary. But we do have information about them, and the ones that are not proprietary, we um, we have links to in the website. Great, thank you. Um, and a question for the NCQA team. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about um, how understanding what matters can help uh, support health equity. Yeah, thanks for that question. That's a great question. Uh, you know, obviously person-driven outcome measures are truly person-centered. They put the person at the center of their care and are very respectful of the wishes, what matters to people, people's decisions. And so to me, that is a, a strong form of equity. Uh, it's important that uh, every person uh, is treated the same, that gets the same type of uh, care at all times, and also gets their wishes respected, and, and in turn gets respect. So from my point of view, person-driven outcome measures are really uh, key to equitable care. And of course, only high, equitable care is high quality care. So hopefully that's, uh, that answers the question, but it's a great question and it's a great consideration. And one of the big reasons that we really are so interested in dissemination of our person-driven outcome measures. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Christine. I, I would just add to that, that, you know, from a state policy and, and just public health policy in general perspective, you know, equity is on everyone's minds. And so when we engage with public sector stakeholders around, you know, what quality is and what accountability looks like, you know, they're looking for tools and tools such as this, you know, kind of this, um, these measures that NCQA is, is socializing um, and, uh, you know, are one example of a way in which, you know, that can be embedded. And so I think it's really important to understand kind of um, what the, what the, um, um, how it supports all of the different stakeholders that are in that equation, as I mentioned, you know, the patient, the provider, and then those that are paying for the care and responsible for ensuring that quality is being delivered and quality meaning equity to Carolyn's point. So I think it really is, um, um, you know, reinforcing of the things, the type of tools that stakeholders are looking for um, to, to support their respective goals. Great. Yeah, thank you. And, um, there's some additional information in the chat on whether the PDAs that um, Washington State has certified are um, able to be translated. Are they appropriate for non-English speakers? Emily, um, did you have anything to add to um, Laura's comment there? Yeah, I would just add, this is something that we're very aware of and that is a challenge. Um, we have not had the resources to review in other languages, some of them are available in, in other languages. Um, and, and Laura called out Respecting Choices, which has um, has a number of translations. There's also a, a group called ACP Decisions that does short videos that are end of life focused. And they've done amazing work in looking at different languages and also cultural sensitivity, because I think this is partly language, but it's also it's also culture. Um, and, and they've done incredible work in sort of working in different countries and different cultures to make sure that they're 
presenting the messages in ways that are congruent and and effective. Um, so yes, this is this is a challenge, and we're not where we'd like to be. Um, but uh, there are some that are available. Thank you. And um, for um, Dr. Blum, um, a question around the NCQA PDO measure. Um, what type of training is needed for clinicians to use those measures? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, again, uh, this is actually similar to what uh, Emily said, that uh, many clinicians sort of think they're doing this, and there are many types of care for complex patients where goals, you know, eliciting goals is what clinicians do. They think they should do it. They want to do it right. And as NCQA went, went, has uh, disseminated this and talked to many, many clinicians and tested it, we find that even though tissue uh, clinicians think they're eliciting goals and are really trying to, um, they often appreciate formal training in it. And we actually believe actually similar to what Emily mentioned into values-based training. We think a lot of goals do proceed from, pa from patients' values. So we, we uh, are working with uh, Patient Priorities Care, which is a group that, that works on priorities uh, and what matters to people as, as to drive care, uh, because they... Uh, are very adept at training both providers and patients in how to sort of deep, uh, come up with goals that are uh, measurable and uh, reasonable and um, and doable, you know, practical goals, and often based on values. So that's one of the aspects of training is how to elicit goals. And as I say, we also think it's, it's good to guide the patients too. Uh, the other thing that we train people in is how to actually do the measures. And that means training them on the tracking methodologies, either on a promise instruments, which some clinicians are somewhat familiar with, or on goal attainment scaling, which people are, are less familiar with. And it takes the, the clinicians a little while to learn the goal attainment scaling. It's sort of logical, but it's a skill Skill, you know, and it's a skill to work with the patients to take their personal goal and to translate it into something that's trackable. But as you translate it into something that's trackable, trackable, you work with the patient, with the person to figure out, to, to make the goal um, practical and something that's actually doable and accomplishable by, by the person. So the tracking actually helps uh, both ways and helps with the communication. So we train about this tracking and how you do it and how you get a good goal. Uh, another thing that we do to some extent, although basically we rely on the clinicians, is to how they develop their care plans and clinical decision makings. And we have to partner with clinicians to really do that part of the training. So we focus on goal elicitation and then translating the personal goal of the person to a method to track it. Um, uh, just one thing I'll say, we've learned in our experience that it probably that some of the clinicians say they need to do about 10 patients before they really feel comfortable with it. And it takes a little bit of time when they're learning it. You know, clinicians are always worried about how much time they have with the patient. Uh, but after they learn it, they can incorporate it into their workflow. And that's been our experience. And that's what we've learned. So hopefully I, that helps. Can I? Yeah. Absolutely. Can I just jump on that for a sec? Yes. I, this is there's so much of that that resonates um, with the work we're doing as well. And of course, I'm thinking, get your measures out so that we can start incorporating them into how <laughs> we're doing this work. But, we'll talk. <laughs> but that question of, um, you know, first, that the biggest barrier to progress is people thinking they're already doing something. <laughs> it's really hard to persuade people to do something differently if they don't see that. But really, you know, time is the only currency of providers, and it, it is um, it is such an important piece. And we have we've seen very much the same thing with our decision making that once it's integrated into workflow, and once people know how to do it and have done it a few times, it doesn't take that long, and it actually saves right. time because instead of the you know oh wait I have another question or the oh, I'm just not sure, pe people get to where they need to go faster. But it does take training and, and workflows hard and critical, you know, thinking yeah. through who triggers this and how does it get recorded and where does the thing come from and how do you, so um, just, just had to call out how similar those challenges are. And yeah, also they, that if you can get there, then it's. Yes. I have to say, we hear from clinicians that they're already doing it and that it's too hard. So, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> but, but I know I'm a clinician. I relate to both of them. <laughs> 
<laughs> you relate to both. The food was bad, and there wasn't enough of it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can, but but you know, people do believe they should do it. It's it's just you know, it's a challenge. But we have heard from clinicians that they did appreciate some formal training, just as you said with yours. That, that to to uh, you know, they're trying to do it, but they like to be trained. They like to feel more comfortable. And we have a couple of other questions. Um, uh, related to sort of who does what, um, one uh, around training nurses, and I, I think this speaks to both the, the PDA, the PDO, and the PDAs, um, and also consumers. The role of consumers in um, performing either or, or both of these measures. So, just wanted to have both of you speak to to that issue. Right. Yeah, I can start on, on the PDO measures. Uh, as I said, we have trained many types of clinicians to do it. And oftentimes our measures have been used where we tested them and we think as we move forward with, with an upcoming learning collaborative to disseminate them further. Um, we, they're often used in the team approach, you know, with complex patients. There's also a t often a team with a care manager or a PCP or, you know, a nurse. Uh, uh, quite often the care manager does it in the setting of a team, like in the patient center medical home where there would be care manager. So qu quite often it's done by a care manager, but it really can be done by any clinician. Uh, and we also think, uh, and as I said, we in the goal elicitation component of it, of it we think that guidance for patients is, is helpful and patients can pick up on this quite well. And, um, and so that we also think that at least in terms of el eliciting goals, patients can probably train themselves to do that and learn how to do that. The, uh, the actual tracking methodologies in our measure of uh, using a promise instrument or using goal attainment scaling, in our, in our vision, it would be done together. So the clinician would do it with, inf with inf input from the patient at the same, sort of at the same time, sit there together and agree with it. And the same thing in our measure with actually deciding whether a goal, whether there was progress on the goal, or it was achieved. Uh, we always required the pair, the person, and the clinician to agree. So that's sort of how I, I hope that answers the question. Because there's several. Yeah. Anyway, I'll stop. And for shared decision making, I, I would give a similar answer. That the shared is critical. Ne neither side can do this on their own. Um, it, and, and lots of people can be trained in how to present the aid. I think the gold standard is really always that it come back to a conversation between the clinician and the patient. The patient understands their values. The clinician um, you know, has more knowledge of their specific circumstances in terms of how they might play out medically and what they need to know. So we would, we would always see that as coming together in a shared conversation. But you know, it might be the patient spends an hour with the aide beforehand, re, you know, looking at the videos, compiling a set of questions, right. but one way or another, it, it ends up together. Um, we did have a question. Oh, I think it just got answered on, um, let's see. The conversation project, those um, items are not yet certified or not certified. That's a, a question that was in the chat. And um, another question, if uh, there are states that are interested in um, learning more, maybe engaging directly with the NCQA on the PDO measure, is there sort of what is the, what is the way to learn more and think about how it might work in a state? Yeah, I, we, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, Christine, you're the state person. Go for it. <laughs> for sure enough. So, so uh, yeah, we're, we're a, a cross-departmental collaboration on, on this work uh, because we are interested in, we lead the relationship with states. So I would say um, if, uh, reach out to me um, and we will get a conversation started because we're, we're really excited about all the ways in which folks are kind of thinking about how this might play out in their state. And we recognize that takes that, uh, there are a lot of kind of different uh, forms. Yeah, a lot of different potential uh, places yes. where this might help states. Absolutely. Um, I just wanna say thank you again to all of our presenters. This was just fabulous information and lots of great questions. Um, we will be uh, posting the recording and the information um, onto our NASHB website at the Palliative Care Hub where um, folks can learn more about these tools. And I also just wanted to flag for folks on the webinar, um, there will be an evaluation that pops up once we close out. So really encourage you to fill that out and provide us with 
feedback on how we can um, provide you with the best information possible. So thank you again to the John A. Hartford Foundation, to the whole state of Washington, and to uh, NCQA for, for participating in this webinar and supporting this webinar. Um, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having us.